I want to thank um, first the Kleenex Corporation for sponsoring this <laughs> event. Um, I, have, I don't think I've ever been in an event where I'm not the only one who cries. Um, so it's really um, wonderful to see. The, and, and I think when we, we're crying like the way we are, it's, it's, that's what comes from the loneliness and the isolation that we feel trying to fight this fight. And I'll talk, I'm going to be talking today. I'm not good, I was getting together one of my slide presentations and I said, no, this is not right. Um, this is not a place to give a slide presentation that you will eventually be able to pick up on, um, uh, on YouTube. There's enough out there on YouTube. What I want to do is I'm speaking here to peers. I'm speaking here to people who really um, have been fighting this fight with me. So what I want to do is share with you what I have, my content that I've learned, but the content that I've learned from the perspective of here's the barriers that we need to understand that make men's and boys' issues extremely difficult and challenging to present to the world. And so therefore, when you are presenting it to the three Fs, your friends, your families, and your um, and your feminist friends, if you have feminist friends, and I encourage you to have them because I think we need to listen to everybody. So if you're, if you're presenting to these three Fs, what, here's what you will probably discover are barriers that you may or may not have articulated that make it so challenging to discuss and present boys and men in a way that would make it so easy to do if it was girls and women. And so I'm going, to be, I'm going to create that framework. Then I'm going to stop earlier than, uh, than time would allow. And I'm going to ask you to get into groups of five and to uh, share among other people in the group uh, what is the barrier that you've, what is the question that you get from others that you have the toughest time answering. And then I'm going to ask each group um, to choose somebody to articulate one of those questions. And I'll do the best that I can to both give my perspective on the best answers I've come up with to that, and then ask other members in the audience to do the same. Uh, this will probably go over and extend to the uh, lunchtime conversation, which was a conversation with, as opposed to a lecture at. But before I get into that, I want to just um, thank, um, is Harry here? Is he here? Okay. Yes, would you get them? Thanks, Joy. But while we're getting Harry, uh, you've been sitting for a long time. I'll ask you just to stand up, uh, turn to your right, um, get close. So I'll start, I'll start in with the possibility that Harry has to go to the hospital. And unfortunately, his mother is having an, another level of challenges. Um, I'm going to give that overview first. And here's, I th when I was on the board of NOW in New York City, um, I started articulating, I was sort of like the token male, if you will, and my job was basically, there is somebody sane who's male out here who believes in us. Um, so that was sort of the function that I basically played. And so I went to the places like the New York Times and Barbara Walters and the Today Show, and I found it amazingly easy to convince them that feminism um, was valid and had, uh, they were not anti-men and there were valid men's issues. Um, I was later to find out that that was, that, my, that was not due to my powers of persuasion. My powers of persuasion were very, it was very easy to persuade people that women had issues. Just like it was extremely easy to tell the TEDx people that Cassie would be a good speaker. Um, that was, it required zero magic. Um, it just um, was um, an easy sell. Um, then I ran into some problems. Uh, when I was on the board of now in New York City, we were having a board meeting. One of the people brought up the fact that there was an issue, that they were getting a lot of letters from women around the country in the 19, this is the early 70s, that there were a lot of divorces occurring, and now had a policy of equality. And uh, Gloria Steinem had often said that what the world needs is more women in the workplace and more men at home. And so this, this is something I definitely agreed with. 
but a lot of women were writing in and saying, excuse me, um, I belong to now, and I've had a divorce, and I know what's best for my children, and it's not my husband. That's why I'm divorcing him. So I, w I don't want now to be telling me there should be equal amounts of time for, with children, with mothers and fathers. Um, uh, if I feel I know what's best for my children, I want to be able to take my children and, and have full custody over them and move away to a place uh, with a new man that I've met and start a new life and not have to worry about thinking about and dealing with a man that I now hate. And so this, dis this created a discussion in now. And, um, and, I, uh, and I said, I, wait a minute, I thought we were in favor of equality. This would be like saying that um, in, uh, if, if you go to the medical convention and the medical doctors say, uh, there's, there is a, um, there, there's, we, we know what's best in medicine and we believe a certain percentage of women is more than, than is enough. 5% would be good. And we'll decide which women should go, um, should be involved with, in medicine or not. And I said, you, you would know immediately that everybody who has a job, who has a function, is territorial about it. They have their own perspective. They have their own values on that. And they believe that they know best. But that's part of the problem, they, they know best. And so that, that if we're really an organization of equality, we need to equally involve um, both um, men and women in the child rearing process. And besides, if we don't, women are going to be overburdened with uh, with boys um, and girls that they don't uh, that they, that they are that they're raising by themselves. It's a hard job to raise a child. You're showing a lack of respect for the for that for that job if you expect women to do it alone. And so, but at this time, I only suspected. We only had the origins of the research. Uh, about how ch children do significantly better when there's an equal amount of parenting time with both mothers and fathers. Now we know very clearly that there's four things that children need when, they, w when, when there's a divorce. The first is about an equal amount of time, at least 40% or more by both mother and father in the process. Number two, we know that the, children, the mothers uh, mother and father needs to live close enough to each other so that they have, um, so that children don't have to make a choice between activities and friends on the one hand and going to the other parent on the other. Number three, that the children, that the that the parents need to, um, that there needs to be no bad mouthing that the children detect. Bad mouthing includes body language uh, that the children detect by mother to father or father to mother. And number four is that there is a uh, that the, the parents are involved in consistent couples counseling, not just emergency couples counseling. So we know that now, but at that time, I only began to um, to sort of grasp some of the research that has now been much clearer on that. <clears throat> so I shared that with now members, and we did have a, a, a thorough debate about it. It wasn't a clear, you know, a clear type of phenomenon. But as it turned out, um, they all said, "Sorry, Warren, uh, we have many we have many issues to take care of politically, but." What I'm going to be, but so we are going to have to make a political decision. And a political decision is we don't want to lose membership. If we lose membership, we'll have less power. If we have less power, we'll not be able to have the impact in the society about other women's issues uh, as well. And so they made a political decision rather than an equality decision. And that began my enlightenment that maybe now was not about equality, but rather it was about um, about more about politics. So what, what that helped me discover, the difference between the political decision and the equal decision, um, is that there was, that I saw what was being left out of feminism and realized that what I was in favor of was not feminism per se, I was in favor of a gender liberation movement. I didn't want a women's movement that was blaming men. And I don't want a men's movement blaming women. I want a gender liberation movement that understands that the world has an opportunity to free us from the rigid roles of the past to more flexible roles for our future. The challenge is how to bring that about in a world that is so feminist oriented. Um, I, I would, I'd like to articulate five things that I have learned that make it that make me empathize with anyone who opens his or her mouth on behalf of our issues. And Cassie has certainly gone through the whole um, repertoire of this experience. 
And the purpose of this is to have you understand that you're that you need special skills, skills beyond your ability to sell almost anything else if you're gonna be selling boys and men's com compassion for boys and men. And the first reason is that historically speaking, we got to be called heroes as men to the degree that we were willing to be disposable like Fred was talking about before. Now think about that psychology of disposability. The, the, wor the world has an investment in men's disposability. It was saved by us being willing to be disposable. And so compassion for men is threatening to the survival of everybody else who isn't dying. And so when you are trying to articulate what's going on for boys and men, you are going down into a deep space that, you're only, that we are only, as part of our genetic inheritance, that no one is able to articulate consciously. It's in there because the people, we are, we are the survivors, we are the outcome of people that made choices to allow their sons to die. No, not to allow their sons to die, but to call their sons heroes if they died. Back to the word heroes in a moment. Number two, we created social bribes. Social bribes is a fundamental concept that we need to understand. We have a part of our brain called the RCZ, the rostral cingulate zone. When <coughs> people get approval, that rostral cingulate zone sends dopamine into the brain. It's what allows, uh, it's what allows societies to unite. And, the, and, and so there's a series of social bribes, and I could probably name about 100 of them, but just let me give you a few of them, that bribe us to be willing to die. Who do, who do women fall in love with, the officer and the gentleman, or the private and the pacifist? So they fall in love, obviously, with the officer and the gentleman. Who do the cheerleaders cheer for? Just think of cheerleaders. First and 10, do it again. First and 10, do it again. Uh, the cheerleaders, what are we seeing under here? We, as the high school kid, we're seeing our first view of beautiful women's legs, the most beautiful in the school. What are they saying that we should do again? We should risk our lives. We should be risk concussions again. So first and 10, risk a concussion again? Interesting message, but we're learning that females will be more likely to, no, 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 not just females. It, it, the most attractive girls in the school will fall in love with us if we risk ourselves, our brains, um, in concussions, as potential spinal cord injuries, etc., playing a sport that prepares us to be disposable. But that's only the social bribe of females, the social bribe of a parent. Let's imagine this, uh, I remember a boy, a young man telling me I was the brother of a, and my, my, my brother was a very well-known football player who eventually went professional. And my father would go to every single game and when, and when the, my brother caught uh, a ball, he'd go, that's, he'd tell somebody next to him, that's my son, that's my son. And then occasionally people would say, um, Oh, who is that next to you, Dad? Uh, that, to that, this was his dad that was being asked that question. And oh yes, this is my son, John. And he just felt like he was excess baggage. And so sun dropping is another, what I call sun dropping, is another thing that parents do as social bribes to show the pride that they have. And so we're, we're, we're contesting, we're going up against all those sort of encouragements um, to to, to, against those social bribes when we, we start talking about boys being something other than being heroes. Um, we have um, peer group respect. When I went back to my high school reunion, my 50th high school reunion just a um, few, few years ago, um, there was more buzz about the, 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 the man in the room who was the end that caught most of the touchdowns, and the other buzz was about the quarterback who threw most of the touchdowns. And we, we didn't have a great team, uh, but we had a, a, but even with a mediocre team, the persons in the room who were being talked about 50 years later were the, were the quarterback and the end that caught the touchdowns. These are all social bribes that tell boys that if, you're, if you are willing to risk your life, you'll be called a hero, you'll be remembered, 
by your parents will be proud of you. Girls will fall in love with you. Males, your male peers will respect you. And if you don't, you'll be the leftover baggage, the boy who didn't make it. And our brain, the rostral cingulate zone, makes it clear to us that when we are approved of, when we're loved and we're respected, that we respond, just like girls and women responded to the social bribes that encouraged them to, f to follow a set of gender roles that were limiting to their lives. Third, if you're a parent of a, your, a son and you're bringing him up throughout most of history, you had in the back of your mind the possibility you might lose him. You might lose him in World War I, World War II, the Battle of the Somme in World War I, S-O-M-M-E, lost one, uh, 1 1.2 million persons was, were either killed or injured in one battle in World War I. I was over in Russia a few weeks ago and they were talking about the invasion by the Nazis of Moscow. Two million men died in the process of resisting that, arrange, uh, that, 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 that um, invasion, without which we probably would be speaking German today. And so, and uh, under a different type of German rule. And so there's the, the, if you're a parent of a son and you're planning to have your son potentially go to fight this type of war and become a hero, you cannot allow yourselves to psychologically attach to your son in the same way that you can to your daughter because psychologically we cannot attach to something that we are fearful of losing. Our investment has to be limited. And so our compassion for boys and men has always been limited in order to be able to prepare them to be disposable so that we could survive. That's what you're up against when you're communicating boys and men's issues. This is all the underneath stuff, the, unart the unarticulatable. And so when you find it almost impossible to get a hearing, a fair ear, blame not the person who you're speaking with. Understand that they, are, they like you, are part of this history. Only acknowledge yourself that you have, for some reason, been able to move beyond this. Another issue, number four, is that there's a conflict between heroic intelligence and health intelligence. They are inversely related. There's two types of physical health, uh, uh, phys health intelligence that are in conflict with heroic intelligence. Um, one is physical health intelligence, and everything I've just mentioned about disposability makes that pretty clear. The second is emotional intelligence. If Mark is my son and I wanted to say, you know, treat him to, to train him to be a man and he was crying about something, I'd feel very, when he was three years old, I'd be okay with that. But somewhere around eight, nine years old, I'd be telling him, Mark, you know, get it together, um, you know, don't cry. So what we teach men to do is, you know, when you're hurt, when you have feelings, uh, tough it out. But people who tough it out and don't share what they feel vulnerable about, we don't have compassion if somebody cannot speak their feelings from their heart. So we don't feel what men feel because we've told men not to what? Not to, not to feel, not express their feelings, not to cry, to suck it up. Exactly. And so it's very difficult to have compact. My, my daughter is going through some really tough times now. And sometimes, and she's a, a good part of the time, she's blaming, blaming, blaming the guy that she has had the tough times with. But it's the second she cries, my heart opens to her. And it's when she's able to cry that my heart opens. And we've taught boys not to cry. And so therefore, to not have the people around them have a heart that opens to them. And fifth is a different issue. Fifth, the fifth issue is that the, four, the first four issues are part of our genetic inheritance. The fifth issue is the way the women's movement has framed male-female issues. Let me have some compassion for what happened here, just so politically you can sort of see the, what, what happened to the women's movement. We had first the, the, the civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement clearly came from a, an oppressor, an oppressed dichotomy. Slave owners, slaves, and the residuals of that. 
but the early feminists were Marxist feminists. And Marxism had the same, the same type of hierarchy of oppressor oppressed. It was the oppressed working class and the oppressors who were rich and the owners. And so from the feminist perspective, it made sense that because men earned more money, that we must be the equivalent of the oppressors versus the oppressed. They, so what they f framed is men earn more, that must be about power and privilege, just like it was in the, uh, the oppressors and the Marxist type of situation, so from the Marxist perspective. And so that became, so the oblig, but, but men experienced it differently. Men saw what we called power as feeling obligated, not power, but obligation. Obligation to earn money that somebody else spent while they died sooner. And whenever you're obligated to do anything, it's not power, it's obligation, it's responsibility. And what is true? When our parents were involved, so in every feminist course in the world, at major universities, feminist line number 101, and course number 101 is, we live in a, a patriarchal world dominated by men uh, making um, rules for men, to, rules to benefit men at the expense of women. But if we take that apart, I would suggest that we live not in a patriarchal world, but in a world um, dominated not by patriarchy, but in a world dominated by the need to survive. And one of the most important things that you can do to reframe any conversation as an activist is to substitute the word patriarchy for the need to survive. And to share that our parents, moms, were trained, their RCZ was, was triggered, to be willing to die in the process of childbirth and sacrifice careers. But dads were trained to also be willing to die to protect their families, whether it was in, in war or in the workplace, in coal mines, and oil rigs. The truth is, I remember going over with Gloria Steinem once in a cab to go to a TV show, and the, and the cab driver tells us, uh, where are you guys going? And we said, a TV show, a TV show, what are you guys famous? And we start talking, and he says, ah, uh, we talked about the you know, power that m women have, uh, men have that women don't have. And he goes, um, I guess we guys earn more, don't we? And, I, and we go, yeah, 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 we do, they do. And he goes, um, so I work 70 hours a week as a cab driver. Do you think I earn more than my, my wife? Uh, yeah, you do earn more than your wife. And he says, do you think I want to be driving a cab 70 hours a week uh, to earn more just because I want to earn more than my wife? And we sort of silent. And he says, you know why I drive this cab 70 hours a week? And I, we go, and I, I get my first little insight. <coughs> I said, so your daughter and son won't have to drive a cab? And he looked shocked at me, shocked at me like, oh my God, you, did, you guys aren't totally stupid. Um, and, so, and so what he got, what he got just from his natural life experience was that just like women said we made sacrifices um, of careers, we made sacrifices in our careers. Our careers weren't for power and prestige only, they gave, we got power and prestige by serving, just like women got respect as women for serving. We made sacrifices so that our children would have to make fewer sacrifices. Who did this? Men? No. Women? No. Both? Yes. Both mothers and fathers did the same thing. Our job, is to, our job was to make our children's lives better than ours, and so that's what feminism has not understood. When you start from that explanation, most people can get on board. And if, if you want to, you know, I thought about today putting you through the experience that I do, but I really encourage you to look up the, um, some of the um, online experiences that I've done with groups um, that are now online, and some of the Tony Robbins things and a few others, where I ask each person in the audience to ask the question, what created the glint in your father's eye? And then when they define the glint in their father's eye, um, to ask them whether that glint is, reflects what your, their father actually did for a living. 
and which would make more money for them following the glint, like roughhousing with their children, or following what, would, um, what they actually did for a living, like being an engineer. And almost everybody begins to understand that the money that my father made was not about power. The money that my father made was about forfeiting power to get the power to raise us more effectively. And, it's, and most people can understand that because most people have fathers that made those types of sacrifices. And some people had fathers that couldn't handle those sacrifices and became alcoholics or ran away and escaped that. But it was not because they didn't love or didn't want to love. It, or um, as Jennifer was pointing out, it was because they just didn't know how to handle it. They didn't know how to get it all together. And most frequently, they didn't feel appreciated for the work that they were doing to make that happen. I have learned in my lifetime that men will do almost anything, like go to war and die, if they're appreciated. But when they're met by complaints and criticisms, it destroys their motivation. And feminism has unfortunately helped to destroy the motivation of millions and millions of men, not just in the United States, but all around the world. But I share those five things because they are so crucial in my encouragement of you to not feel inadequate when you are working with these issues. I, as a person who have worked both with women's issues and men's issues, can tell you that there's no easier sell. There's, no, there's nothing that makes me receive women's adulation more than my articulating what women go through. And there's nothing that makes women and other men more suspicious of me than the moment I begin to articulate it. Some same equivalent arguments like Fred and Cassie have both articulated um, uh, when I begin to articulate what uh, boys and men are going through. So before you get involved with this work for even longer, just make sure that you are internally secure because you will need it. Make sure you're not dependent upon looking, having high status, either both socially or in terms of the money you produce. I made enough money during the period of time that I was working for feminism that I was able to invest it and support most of the work I have done in men's issues. It is not a profit-creating operation, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> the, um, so I'm always a person who will never write about anything unless there's a solution. So what's the solution? There's a lot of different types of solutions, but Aside from being internally secure, one of, one of the solutions is being um, able, able to, to, to know where you get your empathy from. And so I'll give you an example. When I describe to a woman what is happening, uh, how difficult and challenging it is for a man to take sexual initiatives, within a second or two, the woman is reflecting back on her experiences of, uh, excuse me, but I've had men come on to me so strong, they've tried to ply me with drinks, they spend money on me, oh, they don't listen to a word that I'm saying, they're looking, you're feeling my bodies, or they are pretending to listen to what, what I'm saying, but they really have one thing on their mind. And she's having all these negative experiences that she's had, particularly if she's attracted, attractive, uh, with men trying to come on to her. And so while I'm talking about um, men's fear of sexual rejection, she's having all those things go on in her mind. But more importantly, she's feeling like when she did try to say something intelligent to match what the intelligence was of the man that was talking, uh, so that she'd be acknowledged by him as truly a full woman rather than just a body, um, she was feeling like she was not being heard and not being acknowledged, and that really sunk her. Um, it made her feel very badly. So that's what's happening when I'm explaining something from the male point of view when, the, when I'm talking about an adult male. But when I switch gears and I say, imagine your son um, trying to um, take a risk of sexual rejection um, and she interrupts me and she goes, oh yeah, my son, Chris, uh, Chris, he, he tried to reach out to Kathy, um, a girl in school that's a, a year younger than he is, 
and he was just so fearful of, of calling her. And I told her, you know, I said, Chris, you are, uh, uh, and I said, what, what's happening here? You're, you're usually pretty confident. Uh, I, no, Kathy's really beautiful, and, I, and she wouldn't want, want to be with me. Um, and so I'm quite sure, and, 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 I, and, I, and she remembers how she had to sit down with Chris and say that he's a sweet young boy, and he's very competent, and any girl would be honored to have uh, him. And if, it, and if it wasn't, and if Kathy didn't respond, uh, that well, somebody else would, and he at least would learn how to how to make the calls. But if he doesn't take those initiatives, the types of girls he really wants are not going to. So she's telling me what I was starting to say. Because I dealt with boys, not men. What's the difference? Women are biologically programmed to be protected by men, and biologically programmed to protect their sons. Women are biologically programmed to be protected by men, so when you're asking men, women to be compassionate toward men, it, 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 it rings for them like, it, it sounds to them like fingernails on a chalkboard. It just scrapes the wrong way. Women do, it feels like whining. And women biologically are not programmed to fall in love with whining men. They're, they're biologically programmed to fall in love with alpha men. So if you want to combat our entire biological history, go for it. But you'd better be very secure. Um, and second, but if you want a solution that will ring, that will tap into women's hearts and open both their hearts and their minds, talk about their sons. Talk about boys. Because they're women, they're programmed to protect their sons and to protect little boys. And there they see vulnerability. Men have often learned to express vulnerability through anger. And nobody has taught anyone that anger is most of the time vulnerability's mask. It's when, when you, you fall in love, you get angry at somebody you really love more easily than you get angry at somebody that you met on a plane. The more you love somebody, the angrier you get. And so that has not been taught to people. The last, the two last things, if you're wanting to do these issues, there's one skill that's more important than talking, and that skill is listening. And so I, if you're listening to a radical feminist, spend time listening to her. Then after you're listening to her, do not respond. Tell her what you heard her say. Then ask her if there's anything that you distorted. And then if you think that, if she thinks you've distorted something, keep working with her until she feels completely undistorted by her standards, not yours. Second, ask if you've missed anything that she shared with you. Third, ask her if she wants to add anything that she may have left out or may be willing to share that she wasn't willing to share before because she now knows it's safe to do so. And when you've heard her like that, her heart will open. It may not go from zero to 100, but it will be more open than it ever was before toward you. And so then ask her if she would do the same for you. Ask her if she would make sure to not interrupt and just hear your story, hear another side, hear another perspective. Here's something that you used to not believe, something that you've learned from your life experience. Ask her to sit back and listen as if she were listening to a movie and just fall in interest with this character called you. And then ask her, say to her that you'd love it if afterwards that she'd share what she heard you say and you'd love it if she'd give you the privilege of being able to of, of asking you the question whether you, she felt, whether you felt that she distorted anything, whether you missed anything, whether she missed anything. Don't ask for an invitation to add anything more. Be satisfied with what you get. <laughs> 
be. And so that's, the, that's I think, the most important single thing I can say in starting out. Um, number two is uh, after, well, first, first is, is uh, boys is the part, solution number one. Number two is that listening process. And number three is what I call the carpe diem process. Um, the seize the moment um, process that we, we now have a seize the moment opportunity that Greg is taking advantage of, um, which is and um, which is the seize the moment opportunity of Betsy DeVos, seeing that there is that 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 boys who are falsely accused of rape are, are boys who are oftentimes not having their position heard, and that depriving boys on college campuses of due process is really hurting the whole due process um, arrangement, hurting the very the con very thing that our country is built on, that not being able to confront your accuser um, at, at the trial is something that is absolutely a fundamental right in the Constitution. These are things that can be fought legally, like Mark has been doing, and is, a, is, a for, is the forefront um, of, of these legal confrontation issues. This is a carpe diem moment on, the, on this issue. It's a carpe diem moment on, there are many charter schools that are empathetic to boys in a way that the public schools are not. This is a charter moment through the, I mean, a, um, a carpe diem moment through the Department of Education on this issue. Whether the, whether the, whether the political party in power is Republican or Democrat, there's always carpe diem moments. And a lot of them can be handled by legal issues like um, protesting the male only draft registration because our law is set up based much more on equality. The 14th Amendment's Equal Protection of the Law Clause um, requires that we, that we treat both sexes equally. But our, our everyday practice and biases do not follow that. So the law can help bridge the gap between the equality that we tend to articulate that we believe in uh, and, and the cognitive dissonance of the bias toward women uh, that we feel and the, um, and the resistance toward boys and men's issues. So we need to use the law to, to help bridge that gap. But there's, there are moments when it's easier to do this than, than there are at other moments. So those are the three ways. Um, I'd like to now break into groups of um, five. So uh, I really very, I've done this type of thing a lot, so I'm very, um, I've, I've really learned what things work best and what things don't. So I'm gonna ask you to um, take your chairs, get together in a circle, um, pull the circle away from your table so you can actually talk with each other. There should be five in a group, not six, not four, uh, because the timing will work awkwardly if there's more or fewer in a, in a group. Um, so I'll ask you just to pull the chairs out and get into groups of five and, and then wait, do not start any conversation, wait until I give instructions on this. And to, uh, to ask each person in the group to take one minute after you, I'm going to give you a chance to think of this before you start talking, um, but I'm going to ask you to take one minute to just um, share with the rest of the group the question that you ask, or the question that you receive from feminists, friends, or family that you find it the toughest to answer in a way that you feel moves the needle toward their open-mindedness to understanding why you're investing as much time as you are on these issues. What is the question, the objection that you get? Is it, you know, men earn more money for the, for the women do for the same work? You know, doesn't that prove that men discriminate against women? Whatever the question is, I'll come up with that. I'll just ask you if you somebody has used your question already, um, then to come up with a different question. So, person, does each group have somebody chosen who will be a facilitator, who has the stopwatch? Any group that is missing something? It's a short one. It's only two words. Why me? In the, conte in the context of a man's life destroyed, parental alienation, family court. False he's, accusations. False accusations. He's being destroyed. And typical question for a lot of people. Or how, how could this have happened? Yeah. Yes. How could this have happened? Why me? Yeah. And I, you know, we struggle with those, those answers. Wow. So this is not a feminist objection. No. It's an experience of like, how did the world pile this on me? The result of all of the things that we all know we're talking about. Really. I read, I read, I read.
3,500 divorces in my career, my you know, a few thousand criminal cases, many false accusations, parental alienation, being excluded entirely, yes. and you get a good man who's rock solid, who's crying, why me? I tried to do everything right, why me? Yes. Again, I'm not making excuses for anybody. Yes. You know, the, the, the ones that are deviants, I'll hammer on, not a problem, right? Yes. But it's, why me, how, why? And yes. when you have a grown man, our ages, okay, how is breaking down, it's why me? Yes. That's where it came from. Yes, yes, really good, very, very powerful, and one of the toughest to answer, absolutely. Um, yes, this table. Jennifer? I started out as a feminist, but after doing my research, I realized that more victims of crimes in this country are males, including the ones that are in prison. And for the record, I don't want any prisoner raped either. Other people are like, I don't care, rape them, kill them, whatever. I completely disagree. I'm vehemently against that. So what I always get is, well, statistically more women victims than men. Every single time that I try and point out that there's more male victims of crime, and I've got the data to back it up on my website with real people, real stories, women criminals, and I still get, well, statistically more women are victims. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what to say to them. It's so crazy. Yes. <laughs> why do you not? Why statistically, they're people. We're all people. Well, but statistically, they are less likely to be victims of almost anything. So I mean, statistically, they're not. Well, why are we statistically? They're looking at the statistics, and they're just. And it's like. I don't know, they're, they're wearing upside down glasses. Yeah. And, and they're like, I don't know how to answer but, it. Yes. How do you, you know. I want to object to that table in preparing. I got her back. <laughs> the, uh, yes, very good. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and this table? Um, well, I think when we, it really came down to two questions. We had trouble deciding between the two. But the, the, the issue of the pos positions of power, I think, was one, one of the big ones. Just when people ask, well, what about who's had the more positions of power and who's in more positions of power now. It always takes some explaining and you don't, it, it drags you into generalizations rather than what's, really, what's going on at the individual level. And then so it drags you into historical discussion and often diverts. Right, so the question it. is, if men have the power, then how can they have issues? <laughs> yeah, that's, kind of that's a good one. Yeah. Good, very good, so the power question this sort of like, I get, I present the statistics, know my data, know my research, and still, the one why me question. Next table. Uh, I'm gonna stand here because we'll, if I'm in the center, whichever way I'm facing, half the people won't hear me. Also, um, I know Fred very well, and he knows his the best side of his face is the front. <laughs> and the camera is focusing right there. And so, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> What are you talking about? That last one, by the way, was. Uh, oh, thank you. That last one was 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 mine in the group, but they voted it down. <laughs> you got to say it. Yeah, yeah no, it it was with domestic violence, where you know the the science. You just go through the thousands of studies that shows consistently that. Women initiate domestic violence as often as men, and then they go, no, that's just not true. It doesn't resonate with me. Um, but the one that we chose was um, something that we get from feminists and from traditional women. The same thing, which is, yeah, but don't women deserve extra protection? Don't women really need extra protection? How do you answer that? Whoa, that's <clears throat> uh, Fred, would you pass the microphone to this group here? Thanks, Fred. Yeah. Uh, which group were you in? Are oh, you in this group? Yes. Okay. Yes, Albert. So our question is, um, how do you respond to somebody who says to you, "Well, if you weren't a victim, how can you talk about this?" Okay. Very good. Thank you, Albert. Albert, would you pass it over to Anaja's group? Well, 
we we had two and one was about domestic violence in general but more specifically sex abuse well even if boys are sex abuse victims is there really any damage there don't boys side? like sex enough that yeah. it's really a pleasure don't for them boys like sex enough that that's not really abuse yes that's very good um, and then, oh, no, would you bring it over to this, this group? Oh, you have one. Sorry, we're okay. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Uh, Craig? So the question we had for this group was, uh, do you want your son? Is it on? Yes. Is it on? Yes. Yes. Uh, the question we had was, uh, do you want your son to be treated in fairly in family court or any court? Mm -hmm. and that was the question. And, Hopefully, if you ask a feminist, they say, well, of course I want my son to be treated fairly. Well, then we're on the same side. <laughs> Good. So you have both the question and the answer that you give. Absolutely. Excellent. OK. Uh, among these questions that have surfaced, what are the question that you, you anybody have a Please. sense of what's the one you most want to hear the, an answer to? OK. Um, Karen pointed to uh, I, I like your Oh, about power, okay. Um, Men have all the power, why can't they fix their problems? Okay, so men have all the power, why can't we fix their problems? I have a perspective on that, I wrote this little book on this issue. Um, but the, um, does anybody else have um, a perspective on, on this? As, and how would you answer this? Now remember, I'm answering, asking for answers that you feel would move the needle from a closed mind to an open, a little bit of openness remembering to have compassion for all the five reasons why a mind is going to be closed, four of which your genetic inheritance you have no control over and you have to get a little bit through. So with that in mind, um, Florian? <clears throat> well, it makes no sense to look uh, at how, how powerful men are on average because the distribution of power amongst men is extremely different, is extremely uh, diverse here. So. Mm -hmm. And the, the most powerful men, they don't use their power to protect the, the weakest men, but the most powerful men protect, uh, use their power to protect women mm -hmm. and not weak men. Yes. So women are protected by powerful men, mm -hmm. and uh, weak men are just left out from, from all attention. Yes. Very powerful. I think I do find that to be a very powerful argument because yeah. most women do not, and most people do not think about the men that are left out of the process and the men that are um, so in polygamous situations, for example, <coughs> we think about a man having many wives, but we don't think about a man having many obligations through those wives, nor do we think about all of the men who are not wealthy enough to be able to afford those wives. They're the ones that, gets left out, that get left out by polygamy, and so nobody asks that question. But again, always remember, that no one is programmed to be compassionate toward men for the five reasons that I mentioned before. Um, yes, Florian? Yeah, um, I hear this uh, very often too, that uh, there, are, there are societies where men can marry four women, yeah? mm -hmm. and that means that if every woman in a society is married as one of four uh, women to a man, then this means that uh, three-fourths of the men have zero women. Exactly. If, if, a quarter ha is, if a quarter of the men have all the women, the 100% of women, then 75% of the men have no uh, women at all. Yes. And they're the weaker, uh, the weaker three or four, and uh, the ones who have all the women, are, is this, that's, that's the strongest quarter. Yes. Yeah. So let's work with that for a minute. So what, what you can help, and I'll get to you right away, Anosh, uh, what you can, what you want to tap into there is the compassion issue. So if you're talking to a woman about that, um, the phenomenon and, and you share with her that the purpose of polygamy or one of the purposes of polygamy was to allow women to be protected by the wealthiest men. In times where survival was very challenging, we wanted to set the society up in such a way that every woman got protected by somebody. So not all men were wealthy. So not all men, so the, in, in terms of numbers, we couldn't dis distribute them, um, we couldn't get every woman to be protected by a man, so we allowed men who were wealthy enough to be protected um, by a woman. So if you're now talking about to a, uh, and, and, but the people, and we never thought about the men who got left out because we really didn't care about the men 
who got left out because they weren't the ones that were able to be protectors and men who aren't protectors, we are disposable. Um, and men who are protectors, the only, the, we, we want them to risk their lives, but if they survive, then we, again, we call them heroes. And so those are some of the things that I find are able to get women to understand, and this is the key issue, to get women to understand that the whole world has not been set up to work against them. That's the key underlying bother that most, I was with a, a, a woman, I think she'd be okay with by saying this, Jennifer Granholm, she was a former governor of Michigan and she was gonna be the head of the transition team for the Clinton administration. And she is absolutely convinced that feminism is the answer um, and that, that women are discriminated against. And it's only when, because from the perspective of her as a powerful woman, what she all her life was in was power. And so from her perspective, there were fewer US presidents who were, there were no US presidents who were women. That was a clear indicator to her that there's no, uh, that, that there was not, um, uh, there's not equality. There's clearly not an equal number of men and women. But when you program one sex to take responsibility for the world outside the home and earn more money, with the one, the people, and we reward them for that, the people we reward are ones who earn more money and take care of more responsibilities outside the home, even as women take care of more responsibilities inside the home. And it does help women to hear, or feminists to hear, or family to hear, that it, how challenging it is for men to break into women's role. And one of the easiest stories that it is, aside from the, the stories that Craig is talking about, do we all want our children, our grandsons, and daughters to have um, an equal amount of involvement? That's very compelling. But it also helps um, uh, our, our people to know that something else that I just forgot. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, Onaj, you had your hand raised. Um. It, 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 it was on their question about the power and how we're able to fix our problems. With yes. it. I mean, power is all circumstantial because mm -hmm. uh, being strong doesn't give, give me a job. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fix my problem there if I, need a, if I need to have a place to stay, if I need to feed myself, if I need to have a home. I say be, being smart doesn't make you be, be able to be the, the biggest person. I mean, it doesn't make you stronger physically. It just makes you more uh, applicable. Yes. I mean, it, it gives you another benefit in life. It's, uh, power is only circumstantial. And, and for me, just to say as a man, it's just like, I'm not expected to stay home and take care of my kids when I get older. I'm expected to work, do my job, and get through the day. I don't have that kind of emotional resilience as a woman does. So in there, in that, not only right, a woman has their power, has that power to get to those both aspects of life, to work and take care of children. Yes. And for you to expect me to have the same kind of thing and not work with me, and just say, you have all the power, you should be fine, it's different, because I don't have the same kind of emotional resilience, I can't. I can't strive through everything the way you can. I can't do things the way you can. I don't have, I don't have something to prove the way you do. I have my pride. I have my strength, but it, it, it can only get you so far. It's that, it's that extra mile that you have to go that really changes everything. Yes. And that's not power. That's just called being human and wanting. Yes. Good. Let's work with that for a moment. It's a really important point. I do find it's helpful to say to a, a woman usually, happiness for your son and your daughter or would you want them to achieve a high position? And most people would say some version of, well, I want them first to be happy, and it would be great if they achieved a high position. Certainly want them equal access. So if you start defining power in terms of happiness and recognizing that most, and, and, and if you feel, so if somebody, a boy particularly, feels that the only way he can get social approval and respect and love is to climb some ladder to be an engineer or a lawyer or whatever, and lawyers have the highest percentage of unhappiness of any uh, white collar profession, and engineers are close behind. But so they, they climb that ladder because a society needs them and therefore approves of them, but they're climbing a ladder to unhappiness very frequently. And women can hear that happiness is really important and really takes priority over power and the power the way we've defined it. So we have to help people understand that power is really about control over your own life. Control over your own life is about not, is learning how to distinguish what you want for yourself 
as a unique self versus what other people are telling you you should be. That's the crux. And when you start working with people to, on that way of looking at power, that feeling obligated to do something is really about exactly what the word obligated means. It's about obligation. And that obligation came out of roles. And our parents did not have power. Our parents had roles which were obligations, responsibilities. If you have a grandparent that grew up um, you know, X number of years ago, um, they didn't, that generation did not talk about who has rights. They talked about who has responsibilities, who has obligations, and how do we fulfill them, and how do we make our children's lives better than ours. That's what rings home for, um, for, for most people as you're discussing the issue of power. Yes. But I have a responsibility and obligation to beat you. <laughs> 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 I'm fearful if you're all wondering stampede, I'll get hurt. I've already broken the tape. <laughs> <laughs>